Good morning. It's June 30th, 2022. Welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning at this time, Jean Lawler and I, Sara Agamiri and Natalie Armstrong are delighted to host another great webinar on a cutting edge topic. There's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. And our audiences have been so generous with their contributions in honor of our great speakers. Jean, would you please do the honors? It's one of my favorite parts of the webinar each week when we announce the running total of the amounts that our generous audiences have contributed. It's my pleasure, Jeff, and sorry, and everyone. Today, the total of about donations of which we know, people who've told us about donations, we are at 290,000, so that's 290, $225.86. So almost $300,000, and that's um, more than 3 million meals. That's fantastic. So thank you, so generous. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you so much. And today we have another great speaker to present to you on another cutting edge topic. Eliana Torres will be speaking to us about non-fungible tokens, current cases and disputes. We're going to talk about recent disputes, lawsuits the NFT world has generated and how we can get them resolved more efficiently. Eliana is a practicing intellectual property attorney, NFT collector, real estate investor, and retired fitness competitor. After being introduced to blockchain, Eliana became, became an avid collector of NFTs, where she witnessed many issues involving intellectual property. It was then that she decided to use her unique ability to translate complex IP issues into actionable solutions for IP creators and collectors. Eliana practices law for the federal government. In addition, she serves as special counsel with Web3 Attorneys, where the mission is to empower innovation through blockchain, NFTs, DAOs, and tokenization. She's also committed to educating the Spanish-speaking community about NFTs and Web 3.0. Eliana serves as a leader at the American Bar Association, as chair of Latinas in Tech DC chapter, and she is a Discord moderator. And it seems that you can't go to a conference relating to NFTs these days without seeing Eliana Torres speaking on one of the panels, uh, uh, regular on the circuit and a true expert. Eliana, why don't you tell us a little bit about the food bank to which you would like people to direct contributions if they're in a position to do so, and then tell us all about NFTs. The floor is yours. Yes, of course. So the food bank that I chose was in Alexandria, Virginia, which is where I was living before. And I grew an attachment. Thank you so much. And now on to the topic at hand, please. Of course. Uh, I'm going to share some slides. And I'm not sure if this will be helpful for anyone because I oftentimes like to explain um, what an NFT is. Um, but I'll start from the beginning. And if this is a little bit too, um, if you guys want more of the complexities in kind of skip a lot of the intros, please do let me know uh, or stop me if there's any questions along the way. So I do have a few slides about the blockchain and we all know it's a technology that allows the computer to agree on a specific uh, set of values and that those goes go into each block and each block get added to the chain. Um, the chain is impermeable and it is transparent so anyone in the public can see it. Uh, this, this chart here is really helpful for me to kind of understand the complexity of the blockchain and how it works uh, in practicality. So you have a transaction, there's a, a val validators that agree upon the transaction and that what, well, that's what makes it a little bit less secure. I mean, more secure because there is not one central authority that dictates whether that transaction is correct or valid. So there's multiple nodes or multiple computers that are agreeing upon this transaction. So that's what makes the blockchain kind of useful um, in different types of uh, uses. Um, so this is important to, to us in, as we move forward into new technologies and new future uses of, the, of, the, of blockchain um, because it creates a, a level of trustworthiness and is just transactionless cost and a lot of time consumption that would be reduced by using of the blockchain. So 
I do think that we're moving in that direction, the decentralized way that we have transactions now and the ownership that people can have over their own transactions, it's, it's valuable. And if I'm going too fast, please do stop me. I'd just like to go over a few of the key areas that kind of form the basis of non-fungible tokens. So now going into non-fungible tokens. So we have tokens and then we have non-fungible tokens. So some of them are fungible. So sort of like you have a Bitcoin. So you have one Bitcoin that translates into one Bitcoin the same way that if I give you a dollar, you give me one back and I don't ask you for a specific dollar. When it comes to non-fungible tokens, it's more like artworks or something that is unique in value. And if I give you a Mona Lisa, you're not gonna give me a, the same Mona Lisa back unless it's the, the original one, right? So there's uniqueness to it. The actual original one is gonna remain as the only and original uh, and the provenance of that painting is going to remain in that specific painting that was the first and the only one. Uh, so those are the uniqueness hashes that you have in the non-fungible token. And what I mean by hashes is there's this set of numbers that go on the blockchain that make them unique and they get recorded in the, in the blockchain. So you have a smart contract that creates these tokens and these tokens then uh, through the smart contract get recorded in the blockchain. That's the easiest way to kind of understand it. And the smart contract, the best way to understand those is that they have the best analogy I've, I've been able to find to understand it is a vending machine. So let's say you have a vending machine, you have a token that you, you buy a soda from um, that once you put the token in, it, it spits out the the um, the actual soda. So the same way a smart contract has a what if value. So once you have the specific token, if you put that functionality in, it gives you a result. So if X, then Y, um, sort of like a vending machine, you you put it, if you have the, if the dollar, if it's a dollar that it requires, then you have the dollar and it gives you back the soda. So that's why the way smart contracts are, are coded so that they create this non-fungible or fungible tokens that get them recorded on the blockchain. Non-fungible tokens kind of represent the ownership in different assets, whether those are digital or physical. So I could have a non-fungible token that it's sort of like a deed to my house uh, in the same way that we have a, a recorded deed to our house and we don't carry the house with us. The same way the non-fungible tokens is the is the actual token that represents something else that I have ownership interest in. Any questions so far? I will stop if, if there's any questions. So, um, so this is kind of a, a visual image of what the token represents and what it, it points to. So again, it's, it's not, you don't, you own the token, but then what it points to is what you have an interest in and not necessarily that you own it. It, it will be, dict it dictates the pointer, it tells you usually the, through the smart contract what you own and how much of it you own. So I'll get into the nitty gritty of what exactly dictates the ownership of the, the what's inside the actual token and what it points to. Uh, but usually, again, it's created by the in managed by the smart contracts. And then the creation of it's called minting. And that, that's just basically the execution of the code of the smart contract that gets recorded on the blockchain. So here is uh this is will be a representation of what if you go to any of the marketplaces this is what you would normally see which is the image which is what is connected to the token itself um and these are the properties that this this specific token has so this the just the description is jelly and is googly uh, and that goes into the smart contract so the smart contract is the erc721 that you see there um, and it also has a section with the metadata, which is basically, you may think of it as a descriptor of what exactly you're buying. Um, and oftentimes that's where you have the URL that, or the URI. So it, it's basically a pointer of your ownership. So that metadata is going to point and direct to the art that you see on the left-hand side, which you see the jelly. As I, I hope I'm not confusing anyone. I know it, it could get a little complex at, at the, in this point. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're, we're using NFTs to refer to more than one thing. The NFT could be the artwork itself, like a Crypto Kitty or a Bored Ape or one of those, or it could be a symbol of ownership of something else in the same way that the county recorder records deeds. The using NFTs on the blockchain can indicate ownership of just about anything, can't it? 
Absolutely. Um, there are some car companies and well, the real estate market is another side, but there, there are some car companies that are utilizing NFTs to track provenance and ownership and any modifications to cars. So for example, they issue that you purchase a car and they issue a token, a non-fungible non token that is connected to a specific car. So when you sell this car or you make any modifications to it, they update the metadata on that NFT so that they know what's what what changes the cast has go, gone through, or if you sell it, the NFT transfer with it. So then, um, then you have the tra the transaction. You could trace it back to the beginning, so from the car dealership to the newest owner. So yes, you could you could basically have an NFT tied to absolutely anything. I can't wait to hear about the disputes that could potentially arise from that. My mind is going crazy with possibilities. I'm very curious to hear the rest of the presentation. Please, please continue. Yeah, so this is the fun part, and this is where we are having a lot of issues as IP practitioners. And again, I don't, I don't consider myself an expert because I don't think there is an expert. This is just too new and too nuanced to be able to kind of dictate whether there's a right or wrong answer in any of these cases. We still don't have a lot of precedent in a lot of these. We're still waiting for a lot of answers from a lot of these cases, and and there's motions to dismiss that we're waiting on just to see how the courts are going to treat NFTs in in is just in general. So the first one I'll go into will be the copyright and the artificial intelligence. Um, and this one is not, they did not touch on NFTs. And this is just a, an appeal to a board. The Copyright Office issued a decision that basically you need a human author to be able to copyright an artwork. So this is particularly interesting to the NFT space because uh, a lot of the artwork that we have is created by AI technology. So the generative art collections, a lot of them are created by putting in a set of layers into a specific blender, what they call a blender. And this blender creates multiple iterations of these layers and spits out a collection of 5,000 to 10,000 different artworks. So this one is particularly interesting to us to see how it turns out because we don't know whether we could get a copyright registration for a lot of the works that are used in NFT projects, which are usually the generative artworks. Um, so this one in this case is just one specific artwork that was created by Dr. Thaler, who's also appealing a, a patent decision on, on the actual system that he created to create this artwork. Um, but this one, this this particular case is with the Copyright Office. It started with just the decision that was denied or rejected for lacking authorship. And the Copyright Office does not allow non-human entities to be authors. But this uh, particular Dr. Thaler argued that here are your three main points. The first one is that the it the, we do allow under certain conditions that to have non-author um non-author and or non-human entities to to be granted copyright uh, copyright works, uh, sort of like we have the work for hire doctrine. Um, he also argued that there was no precedent to dictate this, and then um, there were a few other issues, and I'm gonna go on to the next slide to explain those. Um, basically, this is the entrance to paradise. The first decision that rejected that was rejected by the board. The final uh, rejection was in February. He appealed in June, and he filed an appeal with the U.S. court in district court in Washington D.C. And he basically, again, he argued the protections of AI um, should be granted to the uh, created works of AI that he he made because a lot of the artwork that he created was specifically. Uh, using a system that he also coded himself. So that's part of his argument. He argued that there was no case law to support the decision and that there should be a different test that should be utilized. And that is whether a machine can sometimes um, create something that is indistinguishable from a person just for purposes of the copyright protection. And the last argument he made was the that the work may be classified under the work for hire doctrine the same way that we have now. So those are, this is, particularly interesting in that regard. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We do know that the UK and China have already agreed to have AI works that could be copyrighted, um, which kind of elevates the pressure on the US to kind of have something similar in place. So moving on, this is a few of the first copyrights and trademark cases that we have. This one was uh, early on. This is just a pretty clear example of the issues we're seeing where there's no, there's no actual uh, contract between artists and founder or the major founders just 
dismiss completely having any kind of sort of ent legal entity in place. Um, this one is just a clear copyright case where you have weather report, which is was one of the projects, and then um, the former artist sued the founders uh, after they excluded him from the actual uh, offer for sale. So um, this one is just based on the character that he initially created. And the space is very unregulated in the sense that they actually took it to Twitter before they filed a lawsuit. So it was a lot of Twitter chatter about what exactly happened. And it was very um, not the way that we would see a normal case go about the the actual the actual claims so a lot of it is he says she said sort of arguments which is interesting but that just tells you how unregulated we have this industry right now and how social media is kind of taking up a lot of the disputes and please stop me again if there's any questions i can't see the chat so if someone wants to just uh quickly stop me please do i'll move on to the more controversial ones nike StockX. so we have all heard that nike sued StockX for having uh infringed having been infringing the trademarks for uh, owned by Nike. This is an interesting case in the sense that stockers may have an argument potentially to kind of overcome this case. Nike, as we all know, has the ownership of all the trademarks and, and StockX has, is a retail platform. And they utilize this, this, the Nike trademarks to kind of advertise some authentication system that they had in place where they sold the NFTs tied to this, the shoes that they normally resell. So they started reselling Nike shoes um, tied to an NF NFT, but the prices were a little bit, a lot more than they normally would be as if you bought any Nike shoe in a resale platform. So um, the, the, that was an indicator of they were getting value, not just from the shoe, but also from the NFT itself. So Nike obviously sued, they are very protective over their marks and they are also entering the space. So they, they definitely took this upon uh, as a clear infringement of the trademarks. And I'll go to the next one. Um, these are the causes of action that was trademark infringement, fault designation of origin, trademark dilution, the injury to the business reputation, and then common law trademark infringement and unfair competition. So those were the initial causes of action by, by Nike. And they were seeking injunction and the delivery for, of the remaining entities just to destroy them and disgorgement of profits and then compensatory damages, attorney fees, punitive damages. That's what they were seeking. Um, now, StockX defenses are actually very interesting because they argued that the NFTs are not virtual sneakers and that that should be uh, one of the, the defining factors of whether they were infringing. So because Nike doesn't sell uh, virtual sneakers and neither does uh, StockX is not si selling any virtual sneakers either. At the time, Nike wasn't didn't have any virtual sneakers in place yet. But Stockers argued that um, this was just an authenticating uh, NFT. So basically it traced the, the authenticity of the Nike shoes rather than actual selling the shoes tied to the NFT or the NFT itself um, as value. So um, basically the customers wanted to uh, make sure the, the shoes were authentic and this is the way they created the, the authenticity value was on the actual tie of the NFT to the actual shoes. Um, they also argued nominative fair use, which we kind of uh, were foreseeing as an argument, and it was foreshadowing of, of what was to come next. And that was um, that they needed to use the image in the product, but this has been debunked a lot of times by commentators saying that because the price of the Nike shoes uh, were so much less than what the stockers were advertising the, the NFT with the shoes, they were getting value from the NFT itself, not just the shoes or the resale of the shoes. And, and then the more interesting argument to me was the first sale doctrine. Um, and that is just permitting, because we don't really have a lot of uh, cases that kind of uh, tell us what whether the digital goods are uh, we have some cases that, that dictated digital, uh, the first sale doctrine applies to digital sale goods, but not in terms of the NFTs. So the first sale doctrine is an argument that, that StockX is making that may be the best argument they have in their hands. However, and I'll go to the next slide because this is a preamble to what happened next, is that Nike amended the complaint recently and they included causes of action for counterfeiting, false advertising, and they claimed that they actually, over two, a period of two months, they 
they went on StockX and they were able to get counterfeits. So the NFT was not actually authenticating anything. It was actually just, um, it was just being sold as the NFT for value rather than, than the, just the authenticating factor. So kind of like you get a receipt when you buy the shoes that, that was debunked by them by arguing the, the counterfeit. So they also out of facts, and I think this was kind of slid into the complaint. They wasn't the, it was partly the intention of going for the counterfeit and the false advertising, but also kind of to um, add that they were entering into the NFT market. So they have uh, since actually issued some NFT sneakers that are tied to their recent purchase of a company called Clonex, that is an NFT company uh, that has some digital. Um, avatars and now they they issue some clothing digital clothing for those avatars including some shoes this is the current state of the complaint we have a nike made a complaint a complaint for the counterfeit and false advertising and then a few days later after they amended this complaint StockX was actually named in a new class action lawsuit um, that by consumers arguing that they actually purchased shoes that were um, counterfeits. So this kind of aggravates the situation a little bit more for stock StockX and it doesn't really help the, the arguments made in defense. So a lot of people have disregarded that they are actually facing this class lawsuit, but I think that it points us in the direction that maybe Nike, um, Nike is onto something with the counterfeit argument. And if anyone wants to read the chat and there's any questions there, please do let me know. I can't, for some reason, won't let me see a chat. Um, I'll go on to the next case. This one is also trademarks and includes some trade dress. And we all have heard of Hermes and Mason Rothschild. And this one, the creator was is an artist who started working on Metaverkins. And they actually had a really successful sale of, of the Metaverkins. It was a, intended to be more of a controversial um, sell at first it included the fetus of uh, uh, inside of one of the of the bags uh, and they they received uh, i think it was about forty seven thousand. Yeah, i have that in my slide about forty seven thousand um in option for this specific bag um and it was a one-to-one -one, so it was just one uh one specific artwork that was sold through this auction so soon after that the same artist created a new series or a collection that was inspired by the same uh, kind of argument of for free, uh, for free alternatives and going against the the actual the actual Hermes uh, use of leather and whatnot and other for uh, uses. So this collection was intended as a second drop. So the first one was the one to one, and this one was a larger drop. And the actual artist just mentioned or keeps mentioning that is a. Uh, it's intended as a political statement or as a commentary on, on the actual Hermes bags and the materials they use to create their luxury goods. This is the actual Metaverkins and the ones that were dropped by the artists are in the back, so they, they have some fur around them. Um, I, I still think they're quite similar if anyone sees it, a digital um, purse that looks the same, it, it kind of embodies the same trade dress, not, not to say that that's the way the court will rule, but they look fairly similar as uh, the only difference being really just the fur in on top of the, the bags. So this one, um, they actually went into negotiations, but despite the negotiations, they actually did file a lawsuit against the artist Rothschild uh, for both trade dress and for trademark infringement. And this is a very interesting case because the argument by by Rothschild as that this is uh, artistically relevant and the Rogers test, which uh, as we all kind of have heard before, which is the, the, the balance of First Amendment and uh, artistically relevant uses and that, that kind of balances out the, the infringement. That, that's the argument that Rothschild is making. And the commercial sale aspect was irrelevant basically is what he mentioned. Uh, so this argument is actually really, really interesting because um, he also filed a motion to dismiss, which is in my next slide. Um, and he filed the motion to dismiss for uh, against the, the trademark infringement claim. And he argued the test, the Rogers test applied on the basis that the digital image of the Marcus bag were art and therefore it should be protected under the First Amendment. 
However, um, the court denied the motion to dismiss um, and actually concluded that the arguments that Hermes used, which is was the Polaroid factor should be applied, not the Rogers test. Um, the court concluded that the Rogers test and the Polaroid, Polaroid test should be applied. And he said that a court of law should uh, be deciding this based on the facts, not, not really uh, on a motion to dismiss. Um, but this is going to be a really interesting one. I think that the Rogers test may potentially uh, be utilized here just as much as the Polaroid factors to uh, decide whether there's a likelihood of confusion. And we can all see that the, the use of the metaverkins and the Hermes bags and, and the marks may, may potentially bring us to um, favorable decision on Hermes. But again, the, the art, whether that's First Amendment protected and whether it's sufficient, that, that's soon to be decided by, this, by the court. Well, Moving on. on a, <clears throat> yeah. the, the fact that these are electronic images does that really make any difference to the analysis? Would it be the same if they were paintings on canvas like Andy Warhol soup cans or just drawings on pieces of paper? So it, I'm assuming you read the decision by the, to the motion to dismiss decision by the court um, because the, the denial of the motion to dismiss mentioned that this would potentially be different if they had been digital goods, so digital purses, as opposed to just the, the actual digital images of it. So basically, if you had a digital, what we call wearables, so if you could bring this to life into one of the one of the uh, the avatars or the the central land or any of the actual metaverse lands that we have, potential that that that's what we read into the motion to dismiss um, the denial of the motion to dismiss that. The court would have seen this differently if it would have been a, a wearable, so a digital good as opposed to just the image itself. I disagree. I don't know that. Um, I, I personally don't know that this would have been any different if if Hermes had digital goods or if Rothschild had created digital wearables. And uh, I think that individuals who see the images may likely still be confused as to the source regardless of whether these are digital wearables or just digital images of the actual goods, if that makes any kind of sense. And, and it could be confusing because we still don't have a defining line of what becomes a digital wearable um, that you could wear in the metaverse as opposed to just the image itself, because a lot of the NFTs are being given the utility that you could transfer this NFTs into a specific land um, and they are operable in that specific land so you could actually convert them into wearables in the in those um in those metaverses so um th that's where i disagree with the court because i think a lot of the utility for some of the nfts may be that they could be turned into wearables in the metaverse so not sure that it changes the the use of the rogers there's a polarity test and and i still think that it needs to be uh, evaluated on the facts of whether there could be a likelihood of confusion and whether the 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 art is sufficient to to kind of avoid the infringement if this is really just an art statement by the and not just a commercial use of the images by the artist to commercialize and monetize Thank does you. that answer yeah i know yeah. it could be confusing because yeah. we don't have a clear answer on the nft versus digital wearable um, but to me it, it just seemed a little bit interesting that they mentioned that 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 it could have been different had it been a wearable Someone raised their hand, so please feel free to jump in and yes. ask. Susan, you have a question, please. Oh, hi, yes, thanks. Um, so are you saying that uh, it could potentially be turned into a wearable in the future, and that's why you're saying that this should still apply? No, so the court, um, not in the future. So right now, yeah, the facts of the case is that it cannot, it's not a digital wearable, but I think that because this is setting precedent, a lot of the NFTs that are in existence do have the utility that you could utilize them or they are operable in specific metaverses. So, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I, I don't think that even though the facts of the case did not include the digital wearables, I think that, it, and it was a footnote, footnote, the footnote that they put in the actual um, denial of the motion to dismiss. It wasn't actually in the body of it, which was interesting. I, I think I would have left it out if uh, because I think it creates a an argument to be made that okay, if I make a digital wearable, 
as opposed to just the image of the goods, then I'm fine because that they this company doesn't make digital wearables or I'm just or I'm just gonna be making digital wearables and it's different than just using the the, the actual image itself for a creation or a work of art. Um, however, I do see that how a digital wearable may be more commercial in nature and that you could utilize, it has utility. So you could wear it on the metaverse as opposed to just a, a piece of art where you're just going to be admiring it for the art value. So uh, I see the argument. I just, I, I think this as a president doesn't really help the NFT space much um, just because th there is interoperability of the NFTs uh, in certain instances where you do have an NFT that could be taken to the, a specific metaverse and be uh, used as a wearable, if oh. that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Could you um, could you please define digital wearable and metaverse? David Baca is asking that. Yeah, so the metaverse we have is just just virtual lands, basically, where you can have the avatars come to life. That's the easiest way to understand this. So we have, for example, Roblox, which already has had a lot, a lot of time in the space, just creating these avatars and kind of uh, virtual life. Uh, we have Decentraland. We have uh, Voxel. So a lot of different um, lands are not interoperable, meaning that they are kind of like different countries and they, they, you can't really go to one without, you know, being able to operate in the other one. And right now that's the way it is. There's no bridge to kind of utilize certain items on each. So when it comes to digital wearables, for example, decentralized, you have to go directly through a specific land or that specific virtual world to create specific uh, wearables. And, and a wearable is just an item of clothing and it could be just, it could be an accessory too. So glasses, uh, bags, anything, shirts, pants that you create that could be used by your avatar. Okay. And those are, you wear them in that specific metaverse. Okay, that makes sense to me. He was also asking if an NFT is more reliable legally than a copyright or trademark. Um, reliable in which, so, they are separate. So an NFT is just like the deed to what you own, whether that's artwork or a trademark. So um, I wouldn't, I think they're separable, but could be united. So I, I did a presentation the other day about the potential of using NFTs to trace assignments or registrations. So you could tie them, but I, I wouldn't make them as more reliable. I think that they just make it uh, a smoother transition or transibility to see who owns what and uh, what specific time. And because anyone can access the blockchain, it could be, um, it, it's transparent to anyone. I, I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure if I'm understanding that correctly. I, 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 think that, I think that covers it. Thank you. Okay. So these are the two main cases. So StockX um, and, and the Metaverkins are two that were uh, really waiting on to, to see how we treat NFTs and trademarks in the metaverse, especially. So we move on and there's a right of publicity case. Actually, there's been about two. This is one of the main ones. And this is just a very common right of publicity case. And because it's so nuanced per state, this one was, I believe, in California. And this was an artist, a rapper who sued a platform for using his name and image without permission to be used in the launching of an NFT project by the by the actual platform itself. So they just issued his image along with the materials that are used to, to kind of the offering of the NFT itself as kind of uh, having him endorse it and he sued for um, under the right publicity under his name and likeness being used without permission. This one's pretty straightforward. Then we have some smaller, not two controversial cases. This is a, a cross claim by two uh, founders. The, um, and this goes into the next case that I'll, I'll mention in a second, but the Board Ape Yacht Clubs, as we all know, is the most popular project here that we have and have come to know as the, the kind of the, the NFT poster child. They grant um, commercial rights to the holders so they can create derivative works, they can create, uh, they can commercialize the, the art that the NFT is connected to. So in this case, uh, there were three founders and they each had a board ape and they decided to come together and create a derivative work of art and launch it as an NFT, utilizing the underlying 
ownership of the board apes that they held. So because they use different layers from these three different uh, board apes, they combined the, uh, the layers of all three and created an iteration of, uh, I think it was about 10,000 different ones that look kind of like this. They called them um, cake apes. This one, uh, it's kind of messy because they are arguing, um, they, they're gonna have to argue which layers were used to use which board apes, in this case, the derivatives. Um, and this is just a, this one to me is very messy because we don't know at what point the license ended because it was three different, um, three different owners that had ownership or the commercial rights of a, of a underlying asset that then got converted into a new one. Um, so they keep taking down or misusing the DMCA. So that's another part of the arguments that the, the DMCA is being misused. Um, and they keep trying to get the, uh, this project to be taken down from the platforms that are currently being sold on. Um, and then at this point, uh, I think they are in conversations to take this uh, offline basically and just uh, uh, get it dismissed but, or settle it before it goes to, 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 actual, to an actual court of law. But this one is just messy because of the next case because the license that the board ape, board ape has is not very clear as to when it, what exactly they're receiving. So there's some arguments that are made that they, they grant full commercial rights. So sort of like an assignment. And then there's other arguments that exclusively say that it's a non-exclusive license. And this has not been addressed yet and has not been brought to court yet or in any lawsuits. So this is interesting because of the next case. And this is the most recent case that happened about three days ago. So I literally just made this slide about uh, a day ago. Um, this has been super controversial and it's very exciting because we haven't seen this come to the forefront of, of all the news yet. So this case is about Yuga Labs who are the founders of um, Board Ape and they sued an artist who was creating some commentary about the Board Apes. And he actually mentioned a lot of uh, comments that may not be true, again, dispositive at this point, but he mentioned that they were Nazis and they were ra racist and kind of just really bringing down the image of the founders of the Board ABR Club. And he decided to create a, a project using the actual exact replica of the images of the Board Ape and it, under a website that would actually create this Board Apes under a different token. So basically utilizing the same image creating a different NFT token and then tying it to it. So exact replicas. Um, he took it uh, upon himself to voice this very loudly on Twitter and other social media outlets, which Board Ape finally got tired of uh, and they went after him. So this just happened and they actually went after him for trademark infringement. The bulk of the argument is surrounding trademark use. Um, advertising unfair competition and some common law claims for trademark infringement, but there was no mention of the copyright is, uh, issue or um, there were no defamation claims either, which was interesting. Um, the copyright claim was really interesting not to be brought in under this lawsuit, but the argument or the presumption by most practitioners in this field right now is that they didn't want to open that kind of worms because of how unclear their license is. So this ties back to the last one that we just heard about, which the, the caked apes is, which does, does not help us in defining how a license is going to be treated in this space and in, in light of how vague it is for them. So if you read their, their terms of use, it, it mentions you get full ownership, full rights of the, of, the, uh, of the copyright or the art that is tied to the NFT. But the following paragraph says that you have a non-exclusive, in, in other words, a non-exclusive license or royalty-free license. So it presume, the presumption is you get a non-exclusive non license under unclear, if it's unclear on, in the language of uh, terms of use normally in the copyright language or grant. But in this case, it may be an assignment on this if you could argue that the signature or the actual writing once you transfer the NFT is sufficient for an assignment, which is required, one of the, the signatures by the assignor. Um, 
So again, this one didn't open that can of worms. It's just surrounding the trademark infringement. And we still uh, we are still left with a lot of questions about the copyright license of the board apes and how much does it really grant the owners um, of this NFT. So that one is my last case. And this is going to be the most interesting one, I would say, just because of how uh, popular board apes are. The only thing I'll say about this one is the major argument that the artist is making right now in defense is that uh, that it was a parody however he made a lot of money from this uh from this copycat issue nft so i don't know how successful that that parody would be defense as a defense so now Eliana, questions yeah yes let me ask just to make sure that everybody understands <clears throat> the dimensions of what we're discussing today can you give some estimate as to how much commerce and how much money is involved with the board ape yacht club and the related projects at this point billions every time there's a transaction they get about 2.5 i believe from just the um from just the the sell and the and the tra the transfer of the nft so they have made a lot of money there's a lot of money involved in this project um i could get an estimate for you but um I don't have it in front of me, but I could definitely find it for you. But there's a lot of, it's just a lot of money that goes into this this um, this project in particular. So where do you think the law will go with with respect to these, to these various topics that are so controversial and hotly contested right now? At this point, it's just very unclear. Uh, we have, I mean, if we noticed the majority of the claims that we've seen in the space surround trademarks. And I think we're, we're kind of tippy toeing on the copyright claims because we're just not certain how they will be treated. Um, so I think we're starting with just the trademark use. And I think once a court defines whether there's enough in the trademark registration for, a, for, for example, like the actual bags, that translates into the metaverse and whether that's enough to protect that, that specific brand. Um, I think that would dictate a lot more than, than we have at hand. Um, a lot of the, and, and I say that because a lot of the different companies, so like domains, uh, GoDaddy and the domain companies have been issuing statements to their current registrants arguing or not arguing, but encouraging that their current registrants have, um, that, that they register in for the metaverse kind of classes or that they register the domains under the Ethereum networks and the other different uh, networks that we have. So like crypto. So a lot of the Ethereum networks that, that and then that ETH or that crypto or that Bitcoin, they have been encouraging the marks or the companies to register under those. Um, so that kind of dictates a little bit of, of where companies are seeing this. And, and I think the court may follow suit. I don't know that if you have a registration for a specific mark that it's going to be so, is going to also kind of protect you under uses of the same mark in, in the metaverse un, until a court decides that. So, um, and then as far as the copyright, I think we need a clear answer as to how, how would licenses be uh, given notice to the holders in particular. I think that's one major issue that we're seeing because we don't have anything to give subsequent buyers of the NFT notice as to what license they're receiving, unless that specific person goes to the terms of use. Um, and that's an active, so they will have to actually go to the terms of use of the, the NFT they're purchasing to, um, to, to decide or to determine what they are getting. Sorry for the noise, apparently someone's building upstairs. So how much of this, Eliana, in your opinion, calls for legislative action and to what extent do our current laws, the Lanham Act, the copyright statute, to what extent are the current laws adequate to deal with the challenges that these new forms of commerce are presenting? Um, so I think that we have very outdated laws applied to new technology, but I don't think they are that, not that they're far off, but uh, I think that we can still use the same laws. I, I do think so. I just think that we need precedent to see how they are applied. So in regards to IP laws, so the Lanham Act and the copy, any anything that's just related to the IP uses in NFTs, I think that we could still apply the same laws. I just think we need to know how a court would read those to be, how would they, they would 
apply those to the current technology. I have more issues at hand with regulations uh, involving securities and involving the legal formation of a lot of these projects. So a lot of these projects are providing potential dividends or, or, or royalties to its holders. I think that the, the laws that dictate whether something is a security, those are definitely outdated. They're still from the 70s. So I have I take up more issue with those regulations rather than the Lanham Act and all the AP laws that we have at hand. Um, I have more issues with those, certainly. And then the formation of the entity. So a lot of these projects that we normally see are founded by DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. And the DAOs right now are not recognized. They're considered um, general partnership, depending on the state, they will be considered a general partnership or a joint venture. But there are some states that are recognizing DAOs as LLCs. So Wyoming, Vermont, and I forget the other one, there's about three that have a Wyoming, the, a Wyoming DAO statute and or the like. Um, but I have more issues with those sort of, uh, of structures. So anything securities, anything business formation, I think are more outdated than the current Lanham Act. Can you give us a little orientation as to what DAOs are, who uses them and for what purposes they are used? And I know that's yeah. new territory to many of our viewers. Of course, so a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. And the intention of the DAO is to have code be law. So these are organizations that are not ran by one individual, but by multiple individuals. And they dictate their the way the organization goes through code. So an algorithm that they all agree on. Um, so for example, the DAO that Wyoming allows creation and recognition as a DAO LLC um, has in the form when you form it, they don't ask you, it's optional, but they don't ask you for the names of who's going to be the members or general partners or, um, or founders, they ask for an algorithm. So which is the contract where it's going to be ruling or making the decisions for this DAO. So they use different houses is what I would call them, where you have different algorithms and all the members get to vote in those uh, algorithms. And, and it's just ruled by code basically. So these are, these are organizations that are decentralized. So there's not one major form of authority or not one president, not one CEO. It's everyone is on the same level. Everyone's making decisions equally. And the, the benefit of that is you have people from different countries, you have people from different areas, and they all collaborate for one common enterprise without having to adhere to one central authority. So these are very common in the NFT space because uh, people want to have ownership and they, I think Web3 is about owning what you create and, and kind of having a democratizing a lot of the, the ownership. So Decentralized autonomous organizations are very common and popular in, in the NFT space for that reason. Can, can you give an example, Eliana, of, of, of a, a DAO? Why would somebody form one? Why would somebody join one? Yeah, so we have different DAOs, some of the most successful ones. One, uh, it's called Flamingo DAO. This one is actually, they actually go through the KYC process and they, so they know your customer process and they go through securities laws. So they have an actual, an actual um, need for accredited investors. So they require that. So they have a filing with the SEC. But for example, they formed as a DAO so that all members could have equal say in what they invest in. So these are investors in NFTs and they will purchase NFTs, sell NFTs and trade NFTs, but everyone has an equal vote on to what they do and how they do it. So they, they, the DAO is essentially, um, they have a, a very large number of members and there's no central to authority to dictate what they invest in, how they invest it in. It's just basically voting through the algorithm and then they change the algorithm based on the votes of the, of the members. And, and that's how it's run. It's basically, it's decentralized. There's not one president, not treasurer. There's no, everyone kind of chips in. And then there's other DAOs that are more um, 
nonprofit in nature where you have, for example, the DAO that was created for sending funds to the Ukraine uh, during the war. So they formed the DAO and anyone can participate, is, is anyone can do, can give what they can, not just financially, but in labor too. So a lot of people are employed by DAOs or not employed by DAOs, but they work for a DAO and they just chip in the with their with their skills and they just have this organization that has no central authority and it if they they raise the goals they they have the goals that they meet and and they kind of achieve them by just having a decentralized authority and everyone having equal say and so are these are these securities it sounds like under the howie test there's an argument there that people are pooling resources, hoping to profit from the uh, activities of others, those sorts of tests. What do you think? Um, th that's my main concern with a lot of these projects and with the DAOs. Um, some DAOs are doing it properly, like Flamingo DAO, for example, like I mentioned, they actually have a filing. Uh, they use an exemption of, to the securities laws under 506C, I believe is the one they use. Uh, so they have these exceptions filed with SEC. A lot of the DAOs are utilizing this now since they've seen a lot of the issues coming at hand. Some of them are going under the radar. I do agree with you. I think uh, there's no real clear line as to when someone is deriving a profit from the uh, from the efforts of others. I think that in DAOs, it's harder to prove just because you have a decentralized authority and everyone is kind of chipping in as opposed to having uh, one person being the sole worker and everybody else profiting, which is normally how you would say that the, the um, securities will fall under, under, that, under that, that scenario. But there have been some arguments as to Ethereum itself from the moment of its inception that it transformed into a, um, in non-security because of the decentralized manner in which it works, which is multiple nodes of multiple people in different countries, different spaces, and is decentralized. There's no one center that kind of controls whether the value of it. So um, it's just, I take up more issue with those regulations right now. There's no clear line as to when something is going to be considered a security. However, I, we do normally, I would normally advise that anything or any project or any any kind of uh, NFT founder that issues something with the expectation or creating an expectation of profit for the holders that may be crossing that line. So for those of us who are in the conflict resolution business, what do you think are gonna be the most common disputes arising, the kinds of disputes to which we will be devoting our attention in the months and years to come? Um. It's interestingly enough, I've heard of a few pro not projects, but guilds under specific DAO. So there's a there's a, a legal DAO called Lex DAO, and they are have sub sub DAOs. Basically, they have sub working groups uh, is the best way to kind of understand it. And these working groups have actually been working on potential ways of creating dispute resolution systems. Um, utilizing the metaverse, interestingly enough. So they will have a land or, 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 a, or a parcel of land in voxels or any other metaverse, and they will have the actual um, dispute resolution happen there. So they're creating systems where you have, the, you utilize Web3 for dispute resolution and arbitration potentially. Um, and there's that's just one of all the groups that are trying to kind of create alternatives to these lawsuits that are coming at hand. But I certainly think that Web3 can come in handy for anyone in the dispute resolution space uh, because we don't want to see a lot of this go to court. But at the same time, we don't have a lot of the systems that are Web3 web friendly. So I, I, I do see there's a space and a need for that. And if people want to learn more or hang out where the top lawyers and business executives are hanging out, where might we look? To, to go or to get more information? Yes, so right now, and, and this may seem a little bit crazy, but Discord, if you're not familiar with Discord, the, the system for messaging, a lot of these companies are using this and a lot of the DAOs and the, the working groups are utilizing uh, Discord to message each other to have the working groups work there. So 
Um, there's two in particular that I would recommend. The first one, uh, and I could share the links to the Twitter spaces for that they have and to their Discord. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Discord, I would start in Twitter. But one of them is LexDAO. I am a member of LexDAO. They have really good and really smart people. They are also, there are also a lot of legal engineers. So they have the, the people who can read code in the smart contracts as well. So a lot of us are, are trying to kind of get well-versed in how to read the smart contracts for the legalities, not just the actual code and the algorithm itself and the yielding fu functionality, uh, which is important, I think, in this space. Uh, so that's LexDAO. And then we have blockchain barristers and blockchain barristers is, a, is, is not as technical, it's not as legal engineering as it would be. And it's just a, it's just a club per se of attorneys working at Web3. So if you wanna get familiar with other attorneys, this is just mainly for attorneys. And we have some law, law students, but the majority are just attorneys trying to either enter the space or already really familiar with the space and have questions and they wanna collaborate. Um, it's very collaborative. And it's a space because it's so small still that people are, are kind of still helping each other try to figure out answers because we just don't have a lot of guidance right now. Uh, so those two are the main places I would go to get well-versed in the space and what other projects are coming up with good alternatives to dispute resolution and arbitration. And what, what's the best way to get in touch with you if people have questions or want to follow up with you? Yeah, of course, um, email or Twitter. Um, um, I respond to either one or LinkedIn. So I, I respond to LinkedIn, Twitter, or email, whichever way. And I could connect you with any of this working group. So whether that's LexDAO or blockchain barristers. So I would be happy to make that connection. Fantastic. What's your email, Eliana? And let me see if I could put it, let me stop sharing and put it in the chat. And just uh, any questions? I know this is a very... Uh, interesting space, but also very complex. So uh, if there's any other questions, please do feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to make any connections to with anyone else working in this space as well. If, if you have any other immediate uh, questions that are more particular to a specific area. This was fantastic. We could go on for a long time. Our time is up. Eliana Torres, thank you so much. Uh, your email is Eliana Torres dot law at gmail.com. Thank you so much. We hope the people who are in a position to contribute to the Alive Food Bank in Alexandria, Virginia, do so. That's the Alive, A-L-I-V-E, Food Bank in Alexandria, Virginia. We'll be back next week with another great program. Eliana Torres, on behalf of Jean, Sara, Natalie, and myself, thank you so much. And with that, we are complete.